this episode, we meet a tattoo artist who survived COVID by moving his art to sneakers. A sparkling gem of a museum you cannot miss, the Intan. City Joe Kathleen enters oblivion and peace by learning how to switch off all her senses in a pod. And City Joe Abby finds a sustainable shop of the future that welcomes you more if you bring your own bags. We meet Jerome, a tattoo artist in our first story. Like many of his peers, he found himself without physical customers and without income when COVID struck. That's right, but Jerome did not leave things at that. He brought his skills to another medium. He moved from skin to canvas and other mediums like skateboards as well. Want to know more? Here's City Joe Bruce's story about Jerome, an amazingly talented and resourceful artist. What's up, Singapore? What happens when you take a tattoo out of the tattoo artist? You know, when COVID hit, many tattoo artists went into hard times because of the restrictions and they couldn't take on clients. Well, recently I heard of someone who diverted his art form and came up tops. Follow me now because I'm on my way to meet this dude to find out more. Hi, my name is Jerome and I'm an artist. I was intrigued by the tattooing art form at the age of 15 with the shows Miami Inc. and LA Inc. Um, I did go to Napa to attend school for a while. Um, I dropped out, it didn't work out, but fortunately I found tattooing through that failure. In 2012, my tattooing journey began. I was apprenticing under Lionel from Traditions Collective. And by 2015, I had begun traveling the world, trying to participate in as many tattoo conventions as, conventions as possible and trying to hone my skills along the way. And in 2020, the circuit breaker hit Singapore and that was a really terrible time in my life. Um, during that time, I lost a lot of focus. It was a very trying time in my life. I lost direction and I lost a lot of purpose as the medium of tattooing was taken away from me. As the lockdown dragged on, I lost a lot of focus. Uh, without clients' interaction on needs or demands, I started to ask myself, what happens when you take the tattoo out of the word tattoo artist and how much art remains and how can I exercise it? Through that process, I realized that there was a lot of other art that I wanted to make. It changed my outlook on the nature of my industry and I decided that there was a whole world to explore films and skateboards and shoes and all these things that I love with a huge passion. This is the first skateboard I made and obviously it's inspired by Japanese art. Um, by putting it on another medium, I felt like it breathed a lot of new life into the motives that I've been creating for quite some time now. Okay. In all honesty, this past year has not been easy. Relearning everything in a different medium that you're uncomfortable in is always it's always scary, but eventually I decided to take the leap. The desperation to have my vision come to life is more important than the trials and tribulation, more important than what other people think about you. I try to be artistic. I try my best, dude. I try my best, all right? One of my achievements and the one thing that I'm most proud of this year is that I managed to open my own personal space to explore all these artistic pursuits, such as, you know, if I'm painting shoes, if I'm trying to think up graphics for the next skateboard, if I'm trying to think up graphics for the next t-shirt, you know, and, and do some nice tattooing as well. It's all within that space, and that's what I'm really proud of. So this pair of Vans I'm super proud of. It is currently displayed at Vans Boogies in their customization station. I was part of a workshop hosted by Vans, and this was the first shoe where I really started to find my style and my flow in um, other medium outside of tattooing is definitely still inspired by tattoo imagery, but because it's on a different canvas, it just breathes a lot of like fresh life into the motifs that I've been designing for so long. So this pandemic is a shared obstacle that we all go through. And I would just like to tell everybody through my experiences to that in this life, we have to either adapt or die. So be adventurous, don't be scared to try new things. Don't be scared to figure out your own path. 
when COVID hit. A lot of lives were turned upside down and many people went into tough times. But you know what? We humans are a lot stronger than we think we are. What don't kill us will only serve to make us stronger. Don't allow the tough times to define us. Instead, allow it to refine us. This is Bruce for Singapore One. Oh, thank you, Bruce, for sharing Jerome's journey with us. You know, I much prefer those personalized canvas shoes compared to those very expensive designer shoes. And why not? It's one of a kind, you know? <laughs> and you know what? It's really proven already that when you take out the tattoo of the tattoo artist, he is still an artist because mm. his real treasure is in his talent. Yes. And and talking about treasure, here's another cannot miss local treasure for all of you. Well, in her relentless search all over Singapore for her Peranakan beginnings, City Joe Belinda was delighted to find a gem in the heart of Singapore. It is called the Intan or Diamond in Peranakan lingo. The Intan is bursting with all things Peranakan and is still the home of Baba Elvin Yap. I've been tracing my roots as a Peranakan for the past 20 years and often I'm faced with a blank wall. Coming! Hello, Elvin! The diamond needs sunshine. Luckily, a friend introduced me to Elvin Yap, a Peranakan antique collector whose very own home is a museum called the Intan. It's lovely! Perhaps here, is somewhere I can search for my roots. This is what we call the first hall or the reception hall called the Tia Besa. So in yes. the old days when you enter yes. the Peranakan house like this, Belinda, yep. uh, you would not be allowed to go beyond this hall. Just yeah, behind you're right. you, just right here, there's a wall. Because there are objects here we want you to take notice of. Things okay. like the mother of pearl chair. So these are items that we put in the front hall to remind people like you and me that we are Chinese. Mother of pearl chair. <laughs> That's grand. I know my grandmother used to have one. Are you Peranakan, Belinda? Yes. My mom is a Cantonese, Good. but my father is pure Peranakan. Now, Belinda, uh -huh. there's so many things here. I know. What catches your eye? I know. This is the first thing that caught my eye. This box reminded me, I think, of what my late grandmother had long ago when she was smoking. You are, right. you are right. You are right. Well, I'm not sure how she smokes the bitter nut. <laughs> Most of them would chew the bitter nut. It. It's quite an interesting one because at one glance, it almost looks like a European, um, uh, I don't know, like a jewelry box or something. Mm -mm, it with, does. Uh, it does. With a European floral motif. Oh, can I? Can yeah. I? Can I? Can I have so you, a closer so you look? So what happens is that the Europeans were also oh, yeah. producing it's really these beautiful heavy. Uh, utilitarian objects. Mm. for the Peranakan community. And these are little compartments where they were put, you know, the... All the different condiments. Kantang, yes. The snake lime, the bitter yeah, leaf. That's right. The, the nuts. Yeah, oh my God. And that's the thing where they use... Cut the nut. Cut, cut it. Yeah, cut it. yeah, yeah. They cut the nut itself. Oh, I remember. I love this one. This is so cute. Look at that. Oh, this is really fantastic. This is the second item that really caught my eye too, you know, when I came because of the betel nut box and then you have the spittoons. You see, you've got more of these spittoons here, which I really love. And the collection here too. It's beautiful. You see, these are rare collections. I remember, you know, that my mom used to tell me that they had all these things, you know, decorated. Mm. Why yeah. is it so? Yeah. I didn't understand then when I was a child. So, um, this is a beautiful piece yep. of embroidery work. Okay. It would have been a Penang piece, mainly because of the colours that you see. Notice okay. that there also is the uh, Fulu Show up there. Ah, Fulu Show. Many Peranakans would have been Buddhist, Taoist, and That's it was true. almost cultural. Notice also there are no dragons. Uh. Yes, there why no is dragons, it so? Yeah. Um, the Peranakans were very matriarchal. Okay. The women's were the So bosses, dragon right? is supposed to be and very oh, male, yeah. so chauvinistic. Dragon are very strong, uh, uh, mythical yeah. animals. Both my parents are Peranakans. Uh, they speak Baba Malay. But interestingly, uh, I was quite clueless about being Peranakan. Mm. Um, in the old days, as you know, in Singapore, we were not too, too focused on culture and heritage. And so mm. it wasn't part of the school's curriculum. Now, having yeah. been doing this for so long and having met so many people uh, like yourselves who are Peranakans and now discovering the Peranakan rules, I always yeah. say, um, 
it's okay if you don't wear batik, kebaya. It's okay even if you don't speak Baba Malay mm-hmm. or eat Peranakan food. As long as you know your Peranakan, when the time is right, it will manifest itself. Never underestimate the passion of an antique collector. Mm-hmm. Uh, we will go the ends of the world to, to uncover every stone. Ah. You ask me ah, a very good question. Ah. What is my most expensive or most valuable item? It would have to be a pair of beaded shoes because uh, oh. it would have been the only thing that my grandmother gave my mother. And for me, to me, an heirloom piece is always the most valuable piece. When I first started collecting, it was never meant to be a museum. It was my private collection. But it's only because of people like you who are curious and kept knocking at my front door okay. and wanting me to share with you. It was when the National Heritage Board came to hear about it and they came and said, you know, Elvin, uh, why don't you just become a museum? And I said, how do I be a museum? You know, a museum has uh, uh, audio guides and you've got maps and I've got nothing here. They said, don't worry, continue what you do, Mr. Yap, you know, and we'll list you as a museum. So, Belinda, we became an mm. official member okay. of the Museum Roundtable in the year 2010. We do a lot of projects with schools. We had this event called Project Intan. Project Intan was something that I started uh, many years ago when I first moved into this house and I invited young children. I taught them. I taught young children how to play Peranakan songs on the violin. Oh. And we did these uh, little small soirees and concerts and we would raise funds for various charities. Over the last, uh, it lasted for 10 years. 10 years just flew by, year on year, and we raised uh, close to a million dollars for various charities. And the whole house will be filled with people. There will be no standing mm. space. It's been a pleasure talking to you, you know, Elvin, and I really learned a lot more about my heritage. Till recently, I realised that people are asking me, you know, Khan, how much do you know about your culture? And I always tell them, no, I really do not know much. And today, it has been indeed an eye-opener for me, you know, right here inside the Intan. So, with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for sharing with me, Alvin. Sama sama. And this is Belinda Sunshine checking out from Singapore One. Hats off to Baba Alvin. Imagine raising almost a million dollars for charity with concerts by his students playing Peranakan music on the violin. Well, the Peranakan culture is such a vital component of Singapore's heritage, with its rich mix of Chinese, Malay and British influences thrown into the cultural pot. And many of these people are often highly educated and cultured, so it's really no surprise that the violin was their musical instrument of choice. Now, for those of you who are interested to visit the Intan, here's the address. You can also find it at the description for our show below. Now, on a completely different note, our next story is all about learning how to totally relax by cutting off all your senses. Wow, tell me more. We all want to relax and switch off from the tensions we face today, don't we? Ah, okay. It's called sensory deprivation therapy. You climb into a tank of water and then just lie there in the dark and disappear from the world. And you float away into deep oblivion. Wow, we must find out. Sensory deprivation is the removal of stimuli from one or more of the senses. The first flotation tank was designed in 1954 by John C. Lilly, an American physician and neuroscientist. Sensory deprivation therapy is said to produce several effects on the brain, ranging from hallucinations to enhanced creativity. It has also been said to have many psychological and medical benefits, such as boosting mental clarity and reducing stress and anxiety. According to float experts, you should go in with no expectations. Now I'd like to see for myself what it does for me personally. I'm going to fit in a quick little workout before I go for my floating session and we'll see how it goes. We'll check my heart rate in a bit. My hand coordination is not that great. (laughs) I always somehow find things that matches my hair. So I'm going to take a break from my exercise and enjoy a little swing time. My current BP is 113. I'm going to use my heart rate as a guideline. I'm also going to see how I feel after and during my treatment. Palm Avenue Float Club 
is located at 66 Kampong Bugis. Amazing vibes, everything white, it was like a mini getaway. The view towards the city was really nice. They played the world's most relaxing song called Weightless by Marconi Union. As I entered the pod, I prepare for an excursion to tap into my unconscious mind. As you float weightless in the silence and darkness, the brain is supposed to enter into a deeply relaxed state. Some people use it to go into deep meditation. For me, it was more relaxing than it was trying to tap into my unconscious. This therapy has floated into pop culture and is all around the world at float centers and spas. You enter the tank nude and are cut off from all outside stimulation, including sound, sight, and gravity. The water in the tank is filled with Epsom salt, providing buoyancy so you can float more easily. I emerged from the tank to realize an hour has passed. So it was really too dark and I started getting a little claustrophobic. I was like, okay, you know what, let me just face my fears and then I switched off the light again. I went into the pod, it was just me and myself. I didn't expect anything or think about anything at all. So yeah, it was quite fun. I would rate it a 7 out of 10 because I felt it was slightly uncomfortable in the start, but I started relaxing after a while. This has been Kathleen for Singapore One. Wow, City Jo Kathleen told me that she had a panic attack as she's mildly claustrophobic. But after the experience, she's actually going back there again. Oh, for me, the choice is obvious. I'll do anything to get away from our noisy kids. <laughs> so you must join me too. Oh, uh, no, no, no. I prefer not to be kept in the dark. Uh, you don't want to be kept in the dark, huh? Mm. Okay, then there's one thing that you wouldn't want to be kept in the dark about. It's about sustainable living. Our final story from City Joe Abbey. Now, we all know that climate change is well upon us and we have to do something towards sustainable consumption. That's where a concept grocery store is coming in to do their part in making sustainable spending intuitive, simple and wallet-friendly. Hi. Why do we have to bring empty containers to go grocery shopping? Mm. Because we are going to a bout store where we can use our own containers. You and your sustainable lifestyle, so mafan! What if I tell you that this store can help you save money? Oh, now I'm listening. Let's go. Eh, hey, hey, then I must carry ya. You good, she good, she good. <laughs> hello, hello. Welcome to Unpacked. Singapore's first zero-waste grocery and lifestyle store located at 6 Jalan Kuras. Unlike your typical grocery store, the products here don't come pre-packed in fixed amounts. You can buy as much as you want or as little as you need. We always encourage people to come and shop unpackaged because the first experience when you buy what you need, you actually save off. So we have people who walk in and like, Oh, actually I only need two dried chilli to cook tonight Then they came in, they buy It cost like 10 cents She was like If I go down the supermarket down the road It will cost me like at least 50 cents Did you know? When you buy products that are nicely packaged and marketed The packaging cost is often transferred to you The consumers All the more reason for shopping unpacked by doing so, it actually reduces one, that is the packaging cost and packaging waste that comes with the food. The other thing is actually reducing food waste because sometimes we buy a pre-packaged amount from the supermarket but we cannot finish the amount inside. Then we throw it away when it expires or when it's clumped up or not fresh. The buying process is easy here at Unpacked. After choosing the product you want, the weight of the container will be calibrated back to zero on the weighing scale and you just have to pay according to the weight of the product purchased. No containers? Don't worry, here are some containers donated by customers along the way. Besides food products, you can also purchase household items such as Soap, shampoo, sanitizers, and dishwashing liquids. 
Or how about these unique yet practical products to help you make the switch to an eco-friendly lifestyle? How open? I guess everyone is aware about sustainable lifestyle. But most of the time, the common rejections that I hear from people when we do talks is like, huh? sustainable lifestyle living. Uh. Mm, I think very expensive. I'm actually, I'm a very common commoner. <laughs> As such, Unpacked hopes that through its products and outreach efforts, people will realize that a sustainable lifestyle is not as expensive or troublesome as it seems. It can be as simple as a change in mindset. Actually, sustainable lifestyle is a very big picture. So it's not all about uh, bringing a reusable straw. It's not all about bringing a reusable bag. It can be very simple. The conscious mind of consuming, which is, do you need or do you want? So sometimes when we purchase things, even in supermarkets or outside, we just think before we buy. Because sometimes all this rash impulse buying, we buy and then we realize, oh, this is not what we want. And then you throw it away and it's not consumed. And that generates a lot of waste. So that's why we always encourage first is the conscious consumption mindset. To make it even more convenient for their customers, Unpacked has a milkman delivery system where they will deliver to you using reusable containers. And the next time they make a delivery, they will take back the containers, clean them and put them into good use again. Visiting Unpacked has made me realise that sustainable lifestyle is not such an abstract concept. It can be as simple as a change in mindset and it is a very practical way of living. So if you are ready to kickstart your eco lifestyle, do visit Unpack its physical store and its website. This is City Joe Abby from Singapore One. Oh, thanks Abby. What a well thought out store. The goods, the atmosphere and the layout all revolve around sustainable shopping. And you know what? They're just a small retailer setting a very good example. That's right. And you know, customers these days are getting more and more conscious about sustainability. And some would even go all the way out to support small shops like these. Yeah, auntie, you see, even small shops like these uh, can set good example in sustainable living. I think our big grocery supermarkets should start doing that also, you know. That is true, auntie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we've come to the end of this episode of SG Now. We'll see you next time for more Singapore stories. Bye! Bye.